Hi, this is Simon, and this is a short video on audio spatialization and hyperreality. I'm going to start by playing two gunshot sounds. Now these two audio files were created with the same gunshot sample, but with very different spatialization. Spatialization is placing an object in a space, or creating the illusion of placing an object in a space. When we think about this in terms of sound, we're taking our sounds, and maybe we'll put them in a certain location, forward, back, left, right, in some technologies even behind us and above us. Or we can create the illusion of a sound in a physical space. For example, something that was recorded in a studio, we can make it sound like it was recorded in a concert hall. Why might we want to do this? Through spatialization, we can make sounds seem more natural. For example, if we have synthesized sounds, we can make them sound more real. We can take instruments or sounds that were recorded in different places and create the illusion that they were created in the same space. And it also, spatialization can help us distinguish between different sounds and layers of sounds. So, for example, in the traditional mixing of music, there's a benefit to placing some things on the left, right, forward, and backwards to give that definition of space. Thinking about the metaphor of our vision, there's lots of information that shows us which of these balls is in front, which is in the back. We can tell which is left and which is right. We can tell the source of the light, and we get all this information from the shadows in there too. So if we consider sound, how are we getting that information about spatialization? We can break down spatialization of sound into three main parts. The direction, which way is it coming from? The distance, how far away is it? And then the size and shape of the space that it's occurring in. Is this happening in a gymnasium? Is it happening in your bathroom? Is it happening out in the mountains? These are called sonic spatial cues. So to dig in a bit, how do we understand direction? How do we know that a sound is coming from our left or our right or up and down? How do we tell what direction a sound is coming from? Well, through the benefit of having two ears, we have both the time difference between when a sound reaches those two ears, and there's an amplitude difference between those two ears. If we're working with a stereo mix, we create direction by turning up the sound in one speaker and turning it down in another, and vice versa. In different technologies like binaural or ambisonics, there's more information that we can present to the ears. So what contributes to our perception of distance? Most obviously, sounds that are closer are perceived as louder. Further sound away is, the quieter we perceive it to be. Also, low frequencies travel further, high frequencies dissipate more easily. So a sound that's further away, as it gets further away, we're going to lose more and more of its high frequencies. We can create this effect with EQs, specifically a low pass filter. So to return to our gunshot sounds. The first one sounds much further away because I've reduced the overall volume and rolled off some of the high frequencies. Finally, the size and shape of a space. Our ears give us a lot of information about where a sound is occurring in addition to the sound itself. A prominent part of this is reverberation. Reverberation is sound that's heard after original sound sources have ceased. So if I clap my hands. The only sound that I'm producing is a very short moment where my two hands strike each other, but then there's an audio tail that gives you some information about my recording environment. What's happening is the initial sound is reflecting off the walls, floor, ceilings, and, and all of the objects. So let's consider the dot at the top to be something that's producing sound, and the dot at the left bottom here to be a listener. Initially, there's a direct sound. It takes a direct route from the sound producer to the listener. Next, we have the sounds that reflect off surfaces. I say next because these sounds are taking longer to get to the listener, and so they're going to take more time. They're traveling further to get to the listener, and so as we know, they're going to have a reduction in amplitude and are going to start rolling off the high frequencies. Next, we have sounds that bounce off two surfaces. These are going to take even longer to reach the listener because they're traveling further, and also because they're traveling further, they're going to be perceived as quieter and may have more of those high frequencies rolled off. 
It's worth noting here that the materials that they're reflecting off of are going to make a big change in their perceived dynamics and harmonic spectrum. So in the studio, we might record instruments trying our best to reduce the sound of the room so we can place them in a virtual space afterwards in our mixing process. That said, looking at this image of the mix, there are some things that do not reflect reality. Think about the relative size of the piano, drum set, and where the other performers are standing. This is an extremely wide pianist, an extremely wide drum set. How do you fit a guitar, sax, vocal, and lead guitar in between all of that drum hardware in reality? Additionally, if you think about this piano with the left hand, the bass, being on the left and the right hand treble being on the right, that's not really the audience's perception of a performance, that's the pianist's perception. It doesn't make realistic sense to listen to the piano as the pianist and then the rest of the band as the audience. In this way, it's not a reflection of reality, instead it's a hyper-reality. Hyper-reality means something is more real than real, or an idealized version of reality. I don't bring this up to call it a problem, but it's something that's important for us to be aware of. We can see examples of this in how photos are touched up for advertising and for media. And some make arguments that social media is a kind of hyperrealism, where we create a reality where we have hundreds of friends, and perhaps we get caught in information bubbles that only reinforce things that we already believe in. Video games, too, in both sound and visuals can be another example of hyperrealism. And the art director of the 2017 game Horizon Zero Dawn even spoke to this fact. But these ideas might inform the decisions we make about spatialization. Do we want to try to create a realistic experience, listening to a singer-songwriter perform to a small audience at a cafe? Or do we want to create a larger-than-life, bombastic, over-the-top production that couldn't possibly exist in reality?